Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, before we get our presentation started uh, this evening, um, I wanted to make a special announcement. Um, for those of you who uh, follow us on Facebook or possibly follow the Oli Valley Community Library, um, you may have already heard of our little collaboration. Um, since we don't have a home, many of you know that we've been looking for a home for many years and the right one has not come up. So what that does is it kind of limits our resources and our availability to you, our members. So what we've decided to do is we approached the Oli Valley Library and asked if they would be interested in a subscription to Ancestry.com. And that's something that we feel fits into our mission. And they were uh, very excited and decided to partner with us. Since they have computers, uh, the computers are free for anybody to use. Um, we have it set up currently. So they graciously, graciously accepted our offer and we purchased the full library edition of Ancestry. So if you're interested in doing genealogy for your family, um, you could do it at the library at no cost to you. And I know home subscriptions are over $100, so it allows for multiple users and uh, anyone can use it. It's free to the public. So we just wanted to let you know that this is a good forum for us to make announcements. We do have a few members of the library board. Um, if you just want to stand real quick and just kind of put your hands up. <laughs> Just so you know that they're they're the board and we've been working with them on this uh, this project. So. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, uh, and it is up and running, so you can go in there and, and use it as you uh, as you need to. Okay, our program tonight, um, our presentation is the stalls of Powder Valley, uh, story of stall pottery. Uh, Jeff Rose is our featured speaker. He's been collecting Southeast Pennsylvania German pottery for over 30 years. Jeff is a student of Pennsylvania German culture and is a native of Berks County. Um, he traced his family roots to the early German settlers who emigrated to the Oli Valley in the early 18th century. Jeff is a longtime board member of the Berks History Center and the Pike Oli District Preservation Coalition. Uh, let's welcome Jeff for our program. Thanks. I'm not used to holding the mic, so this could be a little awkward. <coughs> and will the plate in my head make funny sounds? <laughs> that's not from the war, that's from falling off a bar stool in college. <laughs> okay, so before we get started, I have a couple of survey questions. How many of you are already familiar with the stall pottery? Wow, that's nice. How many of you have visited the Stall Pottery? How many collect Stall Pottery? Okay, good. I'm impressed. And is there anybody in the audience who's related to the Stall family? Okay, I've met Jim, and this is? Okay. Great-granddaughter of Thomas. Okay, and how about you now? Married to a great grandson. Oh, nice. Thanks. Thanks for coming. So if I make any mistakes, you're going to correct me? <laughs> okay, so here's my last question. How many of you are here because you didn't have anything better to do tonight? <laughs> Thanks for not putting up your hands. Okay, I'm going to sit. I don't like doing that, but that's kind of the way this worked out. And Jeff, if... If I lose the sound on this because I'm moving around, let me know. Okay, the stalls, um, I collect a lot of redware, uh, mostly 19th century. I also have a Jacob Mettinger collection, if you're familiar with him. Uh, but the stalls story is particularly interesting because it spans such a long period of time because the families were so large and they were committed to proving themselves to be traditional redware Pennsylvania German pottery, And we're going to talk in some detail about that. That is a collection of Russell Stahl pottery. I just thought it was a great grouping. It happens to be up on the table as well. Okay. The agenda. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the history of redware. I'm sure a number of you have attended the Lisa Minardi talk on Pennsylvania German redware. I'm going to talk a little bit about the small pottery timeline. 
I'm going to talk about each of the primary small family members who were involved in the family potting business. Uh, there's a slide in here on the Stall Pottery Preservation Society. And I actually have some questions for someone that hopefully will be able to help me with what I'm trying to determine about the, the festival. And then I have several examples of stall pottery in addition to items up here on the table which are from my collection. Um, I'd like this to be a little interactive. I don't like one-way presentations. They make me nervous. So if you have any questions, want to stop me, please do so. Uh, if you see something in my presentation that you have a different opinion about or know is not correct, let me know. I'm not an expert on stalls. I'm just a serious collector who, since I retired, was looking for something to do. So putting this presentation together was on my bucket list. Uh, one slide on the history. As you probably all know, uh, Pennsylvania, especially Southeast PA, was a particularly strong area for redware production. And there are a number of reasons for that. The primary reason is because of the availability of the native red clay. So therefore, it became an important redwood industry because of that reason, and because as the population grew and the requirement for utilitarian items grew, the redwood industry um, grew as well, along with that. Redwood was produced in several Atlantic states, but from my investigation, not to the extent of the production in Pennsylvania. It was primarily produced by German immigrants settling in central and southeastern areas of the state. And with the emigration of Germans to southeastern PA came a lot of artistic uh, designs and a lot of motifs that carried through with subsequent generations of Pennsylvania Germans. The stall pottery timeline. Okay, this is a little confusing because it starts, stops, and then starts again. Charles L. Stahl, Ludwig Stahl, born in eight, uh, 18, excuse me, he operated his pottery from 1850 to it closed in 1902. Charles had two sons um, that went on to start the new pottery that we know um, that has been in operation up until the 50s. He also had a third son, James, all of whom worked at his pottery, which was not too far from the site of the current pottery. In 1894, Isaac became the foreman of his father's pottery. In 1896, Charles died, and Isaac operated the shop in his own name until 1898, when Brother James became a partner. The pottery continued operation as a partnership between Isaac and James until it closed in 1902. The Stahl Brothers Pottery. This is 30 years later, and there was a, a period of time of inactivity between the time that the original pottery started by Father Charles Stahl closed, and brothers Thomas and Isaac started the current, or the most recent pottery. Um, from 1935 to 1936, they made limited utilitarian pieces. Customer wanted more. They wanted more decorative items. They wanted presentation pieces. They liked the idea that Thomas and Isaac caught on to, which was to put Pennsylvania Dutch sayings on their pieces and funny philosophical uh, quotes. And uh, they put some fun into the pottery making business. From the 30, 1936 to the fall of 42, Isaac and Thomas made pottery at a very steady pace. In the fall of 42, activity ceased and did not resume until after the war. Okay, a little bit more on the family members. Charles Ludwig Stahl, um, I think it, this following information is very interesting because of the size of their families. With his wife, they had eight children, three of whom uh, were taught the pot and trade by the father, Charles. And the three brothers, again, were James, Thomas, and Isaac. James was kind of a limited involvement in the pottery business. Um, he worked at the pottery until its first closing in the 1900s. But subsequently, very little information is known about James and his pottying career. 
the two brothers that did go on to uh, a successful pottery operation were the brothers Thomas and Isaac. Charles Ludwig Stahl, the father, had eight children. Thomas Stahl, with his wife Alice, had eight children, seven daughters and a son. One of those children, Carrie, became involved in the family business. Brother Isaac, younger brother of Thomas, with his wife Lillian, had eight, you guessed it, eight children. But in this case, one daughter and seven sons. I just think that's fascinating. Uh, son Russell learned the potter's trade and went on to run the pottery. Carrie Stahl Schultz is the daughter of Thomas Stahl. She's a third generation Stahl. She was married to a local businessman by the name of Wilbur Schultz. I'll tell you a little bit more about that relationship. He owned a business in Powder Valley, a milling a business. And Russell Stahl was the son of Isaac. He was also a third generation Stahl. And he, as it turns out, he became the last of the Stahl potters. Here's an early portrait of Charles Ludwig Stahl on the left. On the right is a family portrait. And if you count them up, it looks like there's more than eight children. <laughs> the gentleman in the upper left corner of that photo is a family friend. I don't know who it is. Do any of the descendants of the Stolls in here have any idea who that might be? No. Okay, he was born second generation Pennsylvania German. He apprenticed under another potter, well known in Upper Milford Township, by the name of John Krauss. He established the Powder Valley Pottery around 1850. There was some discrepancy on that date. Uh, I had several reference sources. Some of them claim that that pottery was started earlier in the early 1840s, and others actually say that it started, the best they would commit to was between 1850 and 1860. So being a math major, I took those dates and I averaged them out to 1850. So that's what, I'm sticking to that. In the 1870s, the two sons, James and Thomas, uh, were taught the pottery trade by their father. The um, younger son, Isaac, who came along after Thomas and James, helped Thomas later on revive the pottery. It's kind of interesting how the type of pottery evolved. Initially, because of what I mentioned earlier with the population growing and the demand for utilitarian pieces growing significantly, the uh, potting industry really grew, and it grew substantially. In Charles' case, he produced all types and forms of utilitarian ware, and I list a number of the different things um, on this slide. And at one point, he had as many as six potters working for him. So they were cranking out a lot of merchandise. Unfortunately, one of the components of pottery making, redwood pottery, is the lead that was used in the glaze. And as we all know today, lead is not a human being's friend. And Charles actually contracted lead poisoning as a result, and he died in 1896. At that point, Isaac took over as foreman and worked with his brother James until it closed in 1903. Due to low cost produced alternatives, Redware had a good run. It started in the mid, I'm gonna say second quarter of 18th century and was produced through the balance of the 18th century. It was produced all the way through the 19th century and up until the early 20th century. However, two things led to Redware demise. One of them was manufacture of other less expensive utilitarian pieces. The stonework industry, for example, got kicked off in a big way in about the middle of the 19th century. The other thing was <clears throat> the early phases of the Industrial Revolution, where factory-based production came into existence. So it was no longer one potter sitting at his own wheel making individual pieces by hand, it became more mass produced. So things like yellowware and pearlware and other types of objects that could be mass produced at lower prices really uh, created issues for the redware uh, industry and pretty much led to the redware production's end. <clears throat> 
Isaac and Thomas's revival pottery. I've got a couple anecdotal notes on this. Hang on a second. Nineteen thirty-three, the Small Brothers established the pottery at its new site. A huge kiln could accommodate over one thousand objects. I have a photo of Russell actually stacking items in the kiln to be fired, and it was a huge, um, it was a huge uh, space inside the kiln where they could put lots of pottery, and they did. They made tens of thousands of items during their tenure. Um, the story that I read in one of my reference documents was that Isaac saw a piece of stall, what he knew was stall pottery, being sold at auction as an authentic 19th century piece of redware. So he didn't like that. And a friend of his, I believe it was Guy Reinert, suggested that they sign and date all of their pieces. So that's what precipitated their ending up doing that. Not exclusively, but for the most part. I actually have a couple pieces up here that are unsigned. The new pottery differed from the Father Charles traditional utilitarian pottery because customers wanted something different. They wanted something with ornamentation. They wanted something with um, information on it. Uh, as I said before, clever philosophical adages, which Isaac in particular would, apparently was pretty good at coming up with. So this is my opinion. It's only my opinion. But I, I also know a lot about Jacob Mettier. I have a number of his pieces of regular as well. And the, one of the, two of the events that precipitated Isaac and Thomas opening up a new pottery was one, they went to an auction and saw pieces that were made at the earlier phase commanding a lot more money than they originally sold for. So that got their attention. But the other thing that I really find interesting is that Jacob Mettinger, who was a competing potter, uh, was badly injured when he caught a backdraft while he was checking the fire in his kiln that was burned so badly that he died a few days later. So the local historians and newspapers heralded Jacob Mettinger as the last true traditional Pennsylvania German potter. Isaac didn't like that. So those two events, plus some other things that came up, is what really motivated them to want to start the pottery up again. I just think that's kind of an interesting story. Uh, Thomas's works tend to be toward, uh, as I said before, more utilitarian and traditional potting. Isaac was the one who experimented with different glaze colors, with different ornamentation, and he was willing to go out on the edge to make something that he had never made before. So I think you find a little bit more diversity in, as far as the form of pottery that Isaac made versus Thomas. Here's a picture of Isaac. He's throwing a pot at his wheel. By the way, differentiation between Isaac and Thomas. Thomas preferred the old manual foot-powered kick wheel, just like 19th century potters would have used. Isaac decided he was going to use one of these newfangled electric motors to operate his potting wheel. So he went electric. Thomas stayed with the traditional kick wheel. So there's Isaac throwing a pot, crimping the top of a uh, large jar. He became foreman of the Powder Valley Pottery at a very early age and remained very active in that pottery until it closed in 1902. During that 30 year respite from the pottery making activity, Isaac and Thomas both took on other jobs uh, to uh, provide uh, a living and um, support their families. And one of the places he ended up working with at is the Boyertown Casket Company. I just actually learned that recently. And while he was there is where he experimented with various compounds in the process of manufacturing caskets. So he learned to mix formulas, he learned chemical com different chemical compounds and the different colors that they could produce. So that came in handy when they decided to reopen the pottery.
Here's a photo of Isaac centering a lump of clay on his wheel. I'm not used to this mic, so I apologize for that. And on the right is a picture of Isaac in his bib overalls, smoking his classic pipe, checking the fire in the kiln. That's, by the way, what Jacob Mettinger was doing when a backdraft forced a fire out of one of those uh, fire holes and set his clothing on fire. So it was a pretty dangerous thing to do. Thomas. He was also, as I mentioned earlier, the father of eight, including Carrie, who was the only child of Thomas to go on and participate in the pottery activity. Uh, Thomas's redware, and I, it doesn't seem to be as available and plentiful as either Isaac's or uh, Isaac's son, Russell. I don't know why, which is why I don't have too many pieces of Thomas in my collection. But what he was really known for was the objects that he and his daughter Carrie collaborated on, which were the magnificent Scrofito decorated plates. So Thomas would make the plate while the clay was still green. She would uh, use tools to incise various types of decoration. And I have, uh, I think, three examples up here of plates that were made by Thomas and Carrie together. He was also known for raindrop plates. I have a picture of that later on uh, at the end when I show you examples of their products. Uh, we covered the kick wheel and the Scrofito places, uh, excuse me, the Scrofito plates with the German verses. A couple photos of Thomas. Here he is, applying a handle to a large pitcher, and on the right, I believe he's pouring liquid clay through a mill to make it finer, because when there were imperfections in the clay during the firing, they would sometimes cause a reaction and a minor explosion that would pretty much destroy the piece. So the finer the clay, uh, and they wanted, to, they wanted to have it as fine as possible, the more successful they would be firing it in the kiln. Some more photos of Thomas. On the left, he is applying slip trailed decoration to what will become a pie plate. And there's an example of a slip cup directly below that. They actually made their own slip cups and I've been hoping to add one to my collection, but they're so rare, because they got used hard, I would imagine, that they're very, very difficult to find. On the right, he's holding another large pitcher. These look like unglazed pieces to me. And on his right hand, to your left, he's holding probably one of the quintessential stall pieces that they ever made, which was the ring vase. This was uh, a centerpiece, I would say, Jim, would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So there aren't too many of those around. I know when Russell, later in life, he bought the Fredericksville Hotel. And I don't have many people who knew that. And he and his wife, Alma, operated it for several years. And in the center of the back bar, he had a ring vase on display. So he was pretty proud of that. More photos of Thomas and Isaac. Don't they look like a fun pair? <laughs> they just look like they've been telling jokes all day long. Let's see, what can I write on this dish that's going to make somebody chuckle? Pretty cool. Okay. A couple more photos. On the left, this is coming out of the kiln. Thomas is holding up, excuse me, Isaac is holding up a large flower pot. They made a lot of those, by the way. And uh, Thomas is holding a pitcher. On the right is kind of a rare photo, because as you may Notice they're not working. They're just all dressed up in their Sunday finest, hopefully on their way to do something fun. This is interesting. This is the Stahl brothers demonstrating pottery making on a portable wheel. These guys loved to educate, especially young people, especially grade school kids. They used to love to show them the art of potting. So they would take this portable potter's wheel and they would go to various fairs and actually demonstrate how to turn or throw a pot, as they call it, at these various events. Does anyone happen to know what fair this might have been taken at? Okay, thank you. That was one they attended rather regularly. 
Okay. Stahl Brothers Marketing, and I put marketing in quotes because it's, <clears throat> I'm not sure how serious they were about marketing, but they did demonstrate their potting craft at several different venues. There's the Allentown Fair, Penn State, or Sinus College, and they also did, had some activity with Strawbridge Clothier Department Store. And one of the little vignettes I read about things that they did to teach kids the potting craft is at one of the Strawbridge and Clothier events, um, there were uh, students from first grade and second grade, I don't know what school, doesn't matter actually, and if he gave them their address, he would show them how to throw a pot and then fire it at a later point and ship it to them um, as a gift for taking an interest in watching him uh, make a pot. So I thought that was pretty cool. October 1948, Isaac visited the pottery to see the kiln being fired one last time. A friend with Isaac, I believe it was Guy Reinert, quoted Isaac as saying, I am finished. And that was the last time he saw the uh, kiln being fired. And with these words, some people would suggest, and that's why I included it here, that with his passing, it marked an end of an era of Pennsylvania Dutch folk art in the upper Perkeon Valley. I think Russell did a pretty nice job of continuing that tradition. So I'm not so sure that I would agree with that, but that's what one of the scholars um, claimed in their opinion. And ironically, in 1950, Isaac returned to the earth from which was dug the clay he used so skillfully fashioned with his hands. Moving on to Russell, this is Isaac's son. My impression is Russell wasn't really keen on the pottery business when he was initially involved. He worked at the pottery with his father, but then he quickly enlisted in the war and he was away for several years. When he came back, he found Isaac working the pottery by himself because Isaac's brother Thomas died in 1942. So Isaac was looking, I think, very seriously, I won't go as far as saying desperately, for someone to take over the family tradition and continue the pottery. So Russell, at the time, was single. He didn't really have a lot of financial responsibility or family responsibility, so he agreed that he would take that on that responsibility. So after Isaac passed away in 1950, Thomas was already gone in 1942, Russell operated the pottery independently from 1948 until 1953. And he made some pretty fine pieces of redware, some of which are up here on the table. He was truly the last of the stall potters with the knowledge of firing the kiln, operating the wheels, um, selecting various clays, which was very critical in the art of making red work. Clay was a, a critical component and uh, equally important in their case, special stall glazes. A lot of the earlier traditional potters like Jacob Mettinger, if you take a look at their glazes, as beautiful as they are, they're all pretty consistent. They didn't do a lot of experimentation. Stalls were like off the charts when it came to experimenting with different colors and different glazes, which is what makes collecting it fun, frankly. Um, the last time that the large kiln was fired was in 1956. I don't know what the result of that firing was. I've never seen any pieces of stall pottery that have that date on, so I can't help you with that. Would anybody in the audience happen to know what happened as a result of the last Kiln firing in 1956. Yes, ma'am. So the kiln remained loaded for many, many years. And it wasn't until the onset of interest in the bicentennial and the interest of a nephew of Russell Stahl, whose name would have been Dennis Stahl. I knew Dennis. They are the ones who opened the kiln, so almost 20 years later. With the sack full the whole time. And <clears throat> then they had every intention of firing again, but it never, they never did. 
Okay, so that was all unglazed merchandise that was in the kiln? That I don't know. Okay. I never found any reference to whether it was the first firing or the second firing of pieces. Okay. Um, I believe that was all that was found. From what I understand, it probably was the first firing mm -hmm. because uh, information says that they did glazing, so that would make more sense. Okay. And I'm assuming that uh, at least some portion of that pottery ended up getting sold at the auctions that were held yes. in the early 80s? Yes. Okay. yes. Thanks for that. Interesting. One other note here with Russell is that he collaborated, just like Isaac collaborated with Carrie. Thomas collaborated with Carrie. Russell collaborated with a, a calligrapher by the name of Erwin Mensch. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of Mensch's um, incised designs on Russell's pieces, but I'm going to show you one if you've never seen it before. We'll knock your socks off. Russell, at a younger age, standing in front of the kiln, holding what looks like an already fired pitcher and a scrofito decorated plate. On the right, Russell, at an older age, holding what is considered to be one of his favorite pieces of pottery. Now I've read this in, um, I think the Goda book. Not check me on that. And I couldn't understand, because that's a Turk's head vault. And for those of you that collect red rock pottery, no offense to the maker or to the owners, but it's kind of at the low, lower echelon of pottery collecting. There's, it's so plentiful. There's so many of these out there that they really don't command a lot of value. However, I put a photo in here, a color photo. So I've concluded that the reason Russell really, this is the piece that he was already, the reason he really liked that piece is because of the glaze, which is exceptional. That is really pretty amazing. Any questions on that? I should have asked that four slides ago. Okay, here's another picture of Russell loading the kiln. As you can see, it's uh, pretty large inside. There's a lot of area to store a thousand or more pieces. It's amazing when you think about it. Okay, moving on to Carrie, Thomas's daughter who grew up at the pottery. In her early life, she was a poet and an artist. And then she moved on to making pottery with her father. <clears throat> and her skill that she developed was the skill of scraffito decoration. And basically, scraffito is a Italian word for removing material, which is basically what it is. So when they put multiple layers of different colored clay on the plate, while it was still soft and green, she would take tools and remove the outer layer to expose a different colored layer of clay underneath. That's how scraffito decoration occurs. Did everybody follow that? Okay. Not sure if I did. Uh, they were often decorated as presentation pieces to commemorate a special event. And many of the designs were copied from well-known Pennsylvania German design books. There's one by Edwin Alti Barber, which is Pennsylvania German Tulipwear, which is a pretty well-known book on highly decorated forms of Pennsylvania German redware pottery. And I'm going to show you in a little bit. Oh, sorry. The, the build-up to this is when the latter <clears throat> Thomas and Isaac started the new pottery. They were getting ready to fire it for the first time. And as I mentioned, Carrie was a poet. So she decided that she would create a poem for the occasion. And this is it. It's called What is Fire? She wrote it on May 2nd of 1934, which is the date that the kiln was fired for the first time. So I'm going to read it. Looking on a blaze which death scorched the face, in a red-hot kiln, which has pots and jars for filling. When a thick, heavy smoke, burning wood, not coke, started this morning at five, I never saw such a thing all my life. There are three fire men in all. The rain is continuing to fall. It is now midnight, with not a star in sight. Through a hole I could see flower pots all red 
with glee. Didn't know that poem existed until about four months ago. Here's some photos of Carrie. On the left, she's molding, modeling, excuse me, a dog. I happen to have one of her dogs in the showcase up here. Very rare to find animals by Carrie. And on the right, again, she's not working. She's got some fancy clothing on, all dressed up, dressed up to go out somewhere. This also is, I think, pretty fascinating. Here's a plate on the left, very similar to the one I have up on the table. This is a collaboration between Thomas, her father, and Carrie. On the right is an old cigar box that she used to store her tools in, that she used to do all this decoration. And what really I find very fascinating is that if you look at those tools, they're pretty rudimentary. There's nothing really fancy. They're not high tech. They're probably modified tools that used to be chisels or punches or something else that they modified in order for her to use it specifically to decorate these objects. I thought I would throw in an early view of Powder Valley, bird's eye view, probably taken around the turn of the 20th century, is my guess. Here's a more recent photo of the pottery. And there's a photo of the kiln. Tools of the redware trade. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about how redware is made, because I honestly don't know. I've never done it. But I do know that they, there are a certain number of tools that were used consistently in the making of redware, going all the way back to the mid-18th century up through the early 20th century. We already talked about the slip cup on the left. We have the potter's wheel in the center, either manual or electrically operated. And on the right is something called the cockling wheel, which is where the potter, after he fashioned the object that he was making, whether it was a pie plate, flower pot, a bowl, or whatever, he could use the cogging wheel to go around the top rim and put this coggled decoration around the top. Almost every redware pie plate I've ever seen has that decoration on it. The Stall Pottery Preservation Society. This is supposed to be held the third Saturday in June. But I went on their website recently and didn't see any information about a festival this June. Okay. Is there a reason why there's no information on their website? Okay. So it's June 15th. Thank you. And if you've never been to the festival, it's really a neat and fascinating event. You get to view, you get to visit and tour the pottery. You get to check out the kiln. You get to look at stall-made um, objects, redware that they have on display in a small museum in the house. And there also are a number of redware potters on site, some demonstrating and several selling uh, uh, contemporary redware items. So it really is a lot of fun. All right, this are a few of the reference sources for the stall pottery. <clears throat> These are the ones I got most of my information from. If you're not familiar with it, probably the most comprehensive reference work is uh, the Stall's Pottery of Powder Valley book, which was done by Anne and Barb Goda. That was published in 2008. I also took some information from the Historical Review of Brooks County. Pennsylvania Folk Life, and there's a, a book that I found through a uh, mutual friend of uh, my wife's on the history of Powder Valley, which is not a very available book. I've never heard of it before. I've never seen it. In fact, Ron Pook was here earlier, and he informed me that he and his wife Deb got married in Powder Valley. I didn't know that. So I showed him the book. He said, hey, get me one of those. It'll be expensive. All right, let's go through some examples. Before I do that, though, do you, anybody have any questions about any of the information that we covered? And pardon the people that I have my back to. Yes, ma'am. Where is Powder Valley? Good question. Jeff, that was your question. It is 
um, off of Route 100, located, um, that would be Lower Milford Township, Lehigh County. So it's between, somebody check me on this, I'm not too good with directions, I, but I do know how to get there. It's located between Boyertown and Emmaus on that stretch of Route 100. Between Zionsville and Hereford. Okay. And, and is there a fire company nearby as well? Yes. Okay. So between Zionsville and Hereford. I think there are directions on their website. I think when they have the festival, they probably have signs on it on Route 100. Okay, is, is, that, That's right. is that the case? <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to run through some slides and some <clears throat> stall pottery. This is a really classic example of an Isaac Salt small jug, complete with incised decoration uh, around the top rim, around the shoulder, on the base, and his uh, classic rope twist handles. He did that a lot. There's another beautiful vase by Isaac. Same design elements as the previous one, only this is a two-handled vase. This is the raindrop plate that I mentioned earlier. Both Thomas and Isaac made these. For some reason, Thomas was known for doing the raindrop plates, but I couldn't find an example of that. So you're looking at one that was made by Isaac. Here's an elaborately decorated, I'll call it a vase. It has both incised decoration, applied decoration, multicolored glaze, fluted top rim, <laughs> incised shoulder, decorative base, and twisted rope handles. There's a lot going on there. Again, back to my comment about using rudimentary tools to just put designs on their pieces. Here is a picture made by Isaac Stahl where they simply attached a, an old button to a piece of wood and they used to have to put the impression around the shoulder of the pitcher. Here's a beautiful Isaac Stahl pot. Again, multicolored glaze. I don't know how they did that, but if you look at the lid, I'm looking at at least four different colors on the lid alone. This piece I never saw uh, before. I actually just found this this week. Internet is a wonderful thing. But that is an incredible piece of Isaac Stahl pottery. Again, it has all the supply decoration, all the incised decoration, the fluting, the crimping, the incised lines, just incredible. Here's something you won't find every day, an actual three-piece tea set. Pot, creamer, and sugar, covered sugar. I've never seen one before. I've never seen one in the flesh. I've only seen this picture. I think this is um, <clears throat> one of the periods that Isaac went through as a result of uh, the war occurring and the patriotism that he tried to demonstrate. <clears throat> he used to take these design elements of former presidents, including this one, Abraham Lincoln, and uh, they would draw these impressions freehand on the plates. There's a series of president plates, as I understand. I've only, see, I've only ever seen one other one besides this one. Let me see if I have any other notes on that guy. Abraham Lincoln's graffito plate. I have stalled, I already covered that. I wish I had a better photo of this. This might be the nicest piece of Isaac Stahl pottery I've ever seen. I think this sold in Oliver first a few years ago. Uh, but again, just so many different colored glazes. I don't know how they were able to control it with as uh, rudimentary as the firing processes, 
But this, again, has a lot going on. Probably, s I don't know, six different colored glazes, uh, incised decoration, applied ornamentation, and uh, an absolute winner. This is a 10, as far as I'm concerned. This is the bottom of that pot made by I.S. Stahl, June 24th. 1938, and they often put SP in the center of the object, which of course stands for stall pottery. Here's a simple Thomas Stahl picture. I actually have a similar picture on the table. That's not this one. This is a different one. Another large picture by Thomas. <clears throat> he liked these shades of brown and green, and this is actually kind of a combination of the two. It's kind of like a, almost like a brownish olive green colored glaze. Here's a two slip decorated plate, very similar to the one that I showed you where the uh, slip trailing was being done using a slip cut earlier. Pretty common form. Here's a pretty elaborate Thomas Stahl picture. I think this is a bit of a departure for him. Uh, this one has a lot of malted relief decoration on it. Let me see what other notes I have. Relief decoration, large picture, decorated with a female figure with birds and flowers, dated 1936. I don't know if you can make out the female figure. It's, it's right in the center. This is a, an odd bird. This is a covered pitcher, but it's a very unusual style. I've never seen another one like this that has this, has this elongated um, area at the front of the pitcher to collect whatever liquid would be inside of it before it actually comes out of the spout. So that's kind of unique for stone pottery. This is a pretty common, I'll call it utilitarian piece. They made a couple of different versions of the candle chamber sticks. This is called the beehive form. So if you, can, if you look at it closely, you can see a rimmed uh, candle cup in the very bottom of it. So these, you can actually burn candles in these things. This is a plate, I think we already talked about this, that Thomas and Carrie collaborated on. There's a similar example uh, that I have up here on the table. And if anybody knows how to translate Pennsylvania German, can I give you my email address? <laughs> and I'll send you some photos of, uh, or I should say I, I need your email address, because I would like to do some translating of some of the sayings that they put on these plates. It's a pretty common thing to do. Oh, let me back up on that one. This plate is actually a copy of a much earlier plate done by an 18th century redware potter by the name of Samuel Troxel. And they did this more than I realized. So this is a copy of a much earlier plate that was done by a different potter. Here's another one. This is another replica. This is actually a very important plate that was made by George Hubner in 1786. And I think this Hubner version of this is actually in the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the Pennsylvania German collection. So uh, this one was made in September of 1938 uh, at the Stahl Pottery. Okay, just to make it more interesting. Here's another copy, yet another replica of an important plate made also by George Hubner in 1792. This one made in the Stahl Pottery, September 22nd, 1938. Same exact date of firing as the previous plate. So they were both done at the same time. Now, the plate on the left is the Stahl version. That's the one that was made in 1938. Does someone want to guess there's another replica of this Hubner plate that was also made not too far away by another redware potter. And that would be Jacob Mettinger. That's actually a picture of one in my collection. 
So it's interesting, there's like three different variations of the same plate based on an 18th century object. Does everybody find that interesting or is that the nerd coming out in me? <laughs> Here's another pretty plate. I have kind of a similar example up here on the table uh, done by Isaac this time in collaboration with Carrie. Nineteen forty-seven. So that was getting close to the end of Isaac's tenure, and this, in addition to the sgraffito decoration that Carrie did, uh, she was also known for the modeling of animals, as opposed to the molded variety, where the liquid slip would be poured into a mold. She actually modeled these totally by hand, and they are very rare and highly prized. And I consider myself to be fortunate just to own one, and that's the dog that's in the case. Now, on to Russell. Russell liked his multicolored glazes as well. This is pretty typical of a Russell piece. Double-handled vase, crimped rim, central floral design, dated 1952. Let me tell you the trick with this particular item, because I used to own one of these. Do you see how thin and delicate the bottom portion of the handles are? Easy to break off. I've done it. Here's another Russell Stahl picture. Again, similar kind of a variation of the same theme. Crimped top rim, applied handles with those little curly Q kind of terminations. And then the applied leaves. This is it. <laughs> This is a Russell Stahl piece that was decorated by Erwin Mensch. Just look at that for a moment. I mean, if that isn't a work of art, I don't think there is one. How many people have ever seen this piece before? It's just absolutely amazing. It's even, if you look closely on the inside of the picture, it's also decorated. Jeff, so, raised a hand, by the way. So, pardon me? Someone raised a hand to your question. Oh, I'm sorry, where was that? Yes. I've seen the piece. Pardon me? I've seen the piece. Oh, you have. Okay. It's just a masterpiece. It, an absolutely amazing decoration. So, that gets me excited. It's privately owned, I assume? It it's not in the museum? No. It should be in the museum. <laughs> if I had it, I would donate it to the museum. Okay, here's a Russell Stahl Birdhouse. Have another variation of that up on the table. This one has a bird. Mine doesn't. But he made these in the early 50s. I think mine's dated 1953. The infamous grapes vase. <clears throat> My wife bugged me for about 10 years to find one of these. And I finally did. But this was uh, also kind of one of the <clears throat> premier examples of Russell's work. Because this has extensive applied decoration on it. So he liked to push the envelope when it came to decoration and glazes. And like Carrie, he also did small animal figures, but unlike Carrie's, whose were hand modeled, his were molded. So they were poured into a mold, he then applied the various color glazes, and then they were fired. There's an example of a rooster that Russell did up here. However, the cat that I have was actually made by Isaac. And I have to tell you, I've never seen another one by Isaac, but it's really signed by Isaac. I was kind of surprised to see that. Neat glazes, though, huh? He, he, knew how to, he knew how to pull up all the stops. And that's it. And to repeat a famous quote from Isaac, I am finished. Yes, they did. They did. That was pretty common, actually. Yeah, I failed to mention that. In fact, you'll see the weather report, weather conditions on probably 60% of the pieces. Yeah. Thanks, Joe.
I don't know that they did. I don't know that they ever did. Pardon me? They never did. Because you just can't get the same end results with using a substitute. Lead is really the ingredient, the compound that gave the glaze the shine and the texture that it has. So it's almost impossible to make glazed red or pottery without using some amount of lead. No, not, not if they're made the old-fashioned way. Correct. They should not be used. In fact, if any of you collect contemporary redware, sometimes it'll be noted on the object itself not to use, not to be used for, with food. Are you going to ask me what they use instead of lead? I hope you're not, because I don't know. No, they, they never really did. <clears throat> the hazard of the craft. Any other questions? Interesting. So how many people are planning on going to the festival on June 15th? <laughs> All right, I hope to see you there. Does anyone else have any other questions for me? Jeff, Jeff, has the value of the pottery remained consistent over the years with, with the market of the market? No. Extra beautiful pieces that have, are always going to hold their value, but overall has it? The high-end pieces pretty much maintain their value. A lot of the middle market variety of the utilitarian pieces have dropped in value. But that's consistent across the board with almost all country antiques at this point. You have that upper echelon, the top 5%, that pretty much stays pretty stable. And then you've got that huge middle ground, and that's the market that's been impacted. Yes, sir. Research, I did notice that, especially Isaac, did communicate a lot uh, by handwritten letter to let customers know, especially if they were ordering special pieces that they were going to present to a family member or something special ordered, he would write them a letter to let them know that they were ready to be picked up, which I thought was fascinating. Anybody else? Okay, thanks.
and photographs, of course. We're always looking for photographs. But you can either email the information to us, or we have a full staff of members at the table that would be happy to take any information. <coughs> so um, thank you again for coming tonight. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate that. Have a good evening.